over 300 million of these flying toys have been sold. Research shows that 90% of Americans have used one at least once. Some say that uh, it originated um, in a, a, actually at a pie company based on a pie tin. And then others say that the ancient Greeks invented it. I'm, of course, talking about the all-American Frisbee, right? You know, that, that flat, round, plastic thing that we toss around on Memorial Day weekend or when we're at the beach, right? Raise your hand if you've used one. Raise your hand if you have used a Frisbee. I think that's 90%. See, statisticians are always right. Uh, what would happen if you would give one of these, like you take a Frisbee and you give it to someone who's never used it before? They've never seen it, they've never seen anyone play with it, they've never held one, they've never used it before. You might give it to them and they turn it upside down and they think, wow, that's a platter for nachos. Or that would be a, that, that would be a great uh, dish for dog food. Or I could put it on my head and it's like a flat, hard hat there's right and you're thinking that sounds silly but let me tell you this we it's easy to not know the best purpose of a product or a person so are you serving in your sweet spot right now in the area of strength that God has designed for you and given to you? And are you soaring? Are you soaring above all, all the circumstances, all the lies? Are you flying high, spinning happily and beautifully, not, not crazily, not, not in stress, but you're like, you're like a Frisbee, and you're just soaring and, and pursuing God's purpose for you? Are you? Today, we want to explore I just want to pause and take a step back and look at the who and the why and the what and the how and the how much of serving. So that you can clearly and confidently pursue God's purpose for you and you don't end up like a forsaken, forgotten, stinky dish of dog food and a frisbee. So what is God's purpose for you? Anyone daring enough to raise your hand right now and answer that question? What is God's purpose for you? I'm gonna, t I'm gonna break it apart and give you three things. Two of them are gonna be really quick right now. There's a front end purpose, there's a front end answer to that. This is your front end purpose. Okay, if someone asks you, what's your purpose? The first answer to that is to believe in Jesus. We covered that last week. If you weren't here, go back and watch the video. First and foremost, do not forget this. Even after you're saved, after you're a believer, if you're confused about your purpose, go back and start there. It's the best thing that you can do. Believe in Jesus. Okay, that's the front end purpose. And then you have a back end purpose or a, a final end, an ultimate destiny purpose. Can you guess what that is? Right? First purpose is go to believe in Jesus. Oh, we almost said it. Final purpose is is to live eternally in heaven. And then there's this in between. That's what I'm talking about today, the middle part. There's the answer to this question. What did God have in mind for you today when he woke you up and got you out of bed? Because he has, he has a purpose for you by getting you out of bed today. What is it? I'm going to help you answer that question. Well, the, the Bible's going to help you answer that question, right? So let's go to, I'm going to Romans chapter 12. And here's, here's the beginning of the answer to that, that, that middle purpose. After you believe and before you go to heaven, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. See, when anyone believes in Jesus, we want to serve him. Okay, so Jesus gave his life to serve us, so when we believe in Jesus, we want our life 
to serve him. That's what, that's what this verse is saying. Jesus saves us by a sacrifice. He gave up paradise in heaven, came to this earth. He suffered and he died. He died on the cross. That's a sacrifice, a substitutionary gift that God makes. He sacrifices his own son, Jesus, and Jesus gives us his holiness, and we give Jesus our sin, and God says, that's an okay deal. I can handle it in my son who then rises from the dead. Jesus sacrificed himself, and now he, he has mercy on you, and that's forgiveness. All your sins, all of them are forgiven, all of them. That's how Jesus serves you and sacrifices you in that way. So, okay, so you want your life to serve Jesus. That's not easy. And it's not just a matter of having clarity about your purpose. It's not easy to actually operate in that way because of what I'm going to tell you next. You're a selfish person. I know that because you were made that way, and so was I. By nature, by instinct, before you believed in Jesus, you learned to operate based on self-survival and instincts. And you learned how to take care of number one. And even after you become a believer, that still pulls at us like gravity. It's constant. We can't get away from it. Even when you're baptized, you're a believer, that's going to stay with you. It's called your sinful flesh. And it's going to stay with you and pull you down, me first. And that makes it hard to serve Jesus sacrificially. How? Because because you're all about achieving. And achievement is awesome, except our sinful selfishness wants that achievement to feel good to us more than to be good for others. And you're all about building an impressive profile online or on LinkedIn or in your resume to appear to the world out there as impressive as possible, even when it perhaps compromises being impressive to Jesus. And then there's consume, 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 consume. And I'm, I, want, I want to consume convenience. And I'm going to consume it, at, uh, consume it at a cost that's higher than I can afford. And I'm going to consume it so much that I'm overcommitted on my calendar so much that it's hurting my spirit. What does God say about all that? Here it is. He says, don't do it. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. That word pattern is really important. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Pattern means, you know, it's it's common. We can can observe it. This is is not a a shock. (gasps) Okay, everything I mentioned to you about achieving and, and, and building and pressing, all that is old news. That's not new. That's a it's a pattern. And that's what makes it challenging for us because everyone else is doing it all out in the world. Everyone else is doing it. And so we see them doing it, and we do it too, and we don't notice that we're doing it because everyone's doing it. There's a, this, it's a pattern. That makes things challenging, that, that pattern. Now, here's another part of that challenge. There's this gravity that pulls us into ourselves, that selfishness. There's also a gravity that pulls us out into the the world, into the sinfulness and lostness and darkness around us. And and that's what the Bible mentions next, that we have to be careful of this, because what what does that that cause us to do? It causes, as I go this way, now it causes me not to consume, only do that, but also to compare. And I compare and I compare and I compare And when I do, I complain. I grumble that other people don't think of things and do things the way that I do them. And I give up when I look at how everyone else is serving, and they're not serving the way that I'm serving, and they're not doing as hard a work as I'm doing hard work, so I give up. That's it. I'm I'm done. Okay? That's the gravity of, of what... What does God say about that? He says, don't do this. Hey, verse 3 says, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Or 
right? Make sure that person next to you heard that, right? They're talking about you, dear. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. So here's the antidote to that. You should think, absolutely think, but think about Jesus more highly and more highly. Think, think about Jesus more highly. Compare yourself to him. Um, this, that, it sounds simple, but it's transformational. It transforms you. It's the renewing of your mind. This is like an upgrade to your thoughts, to your brain. When you say, God, I want to, I want to download this faith that you've already given me, the faith that God has distributed to you, it says in Romans, I, I, I'm going to t download that guy, God, and, and I'm going to upgrade my thinking. And when I do, whoa, I'm going to be less of a consumer, less of a complainer, less of a grumbler. I, I'm, I'm going to partner with you, Jesus. I'm, going to, I'm not going to be intoxicated with myself and my worries and my letdowns and my problems, and my pains, and my fears. Because when those intoxicate you, you walk around dizzy, not knowing what your purpose is, other than to survive. But when we're consumed by Jesus, consumed with Jesus, I mean addicted to Jesus, binge Jesus, people, and when I'm consumed by Jesus, that intoxication goes away. And then I have clarity. Then I have sober judgment, says in Romans 12. Sober judgment, clarity, purpose, all there. So this was clarified for me, this, this pattern and this, this way of doing things. When uh, I was having a conversation with my coach, this was, he's a Christian life coach, specializes in pastors. Maybe 10 years ago? I don't know. And I was struggling with my work, uh, family, balance, life balance, and put together a list of my hours, how many hours should I be working, and I just, I'm like, I don't know, it doesn't seem right, is it right? I don't know, I should, maybe I should be doing more. Maybe I should be doing less. I, I, coach, help me out. Give me the answer, coach. How many hours a week should I be working? Guess what he said? As a good coach, he didn't say anything, he asked a question. Oh! He said, Darren, here's, here's what you need to do. Ask, ask this question. I guess this is kind of a statement, but he told me to ask a question. Am I pleasing God? Does it? He didn't tell me how many hours. He didn't tell me to do this task, not that task. It was all about serving, and am I serving God well? And answer, right? Darren, be, don't get intoxicated with all this stuff. Have a sober mind and, and think about Jesus more highly. And when you do this stuff, you're going to find is well taken care of. Kristen Talbot is her name. Kristen Talbot. Kristen Talbot won a spot on the uh, U.S. women's speed skating team for the 1994 Olympics. And if you've trained for the Olympics like I have, you know that... What? You didn't believe that for a second, did you? You're right. When a person trains for the Olympics like you all have, pfft, okay, it's very intense, right? It's very rigid. I mean, these people are up at four in the morning to go to, to, go to the skating rink, and, right? And, and, and it's so detailed because you can win or lose a medal based on 0 .001 of a second, right? Just milliseconds make the difference. So they have to be dialed into their training every day, every hour, uh, tracking their calories. What do you eat and when? How much sleep are you getting? How much sunshine are you getting? Well, everything. And if you skip a beat, you're done. Your Olympic hopes for a medal are done because everyone else is ahead of you who's disciplined enough to keep that rigorous routine. A few weeks before the 1994 Olympics, Kristen Talbot's brother became seriously, critically ill and needed a bone marrow transplant. And she was the best match. 
she paused her Olympic training, went in for minor surgery, which doesn't sound minor because it was over two hours, and they took a device that looks like a corkscrew, and in multiple places in her hip, extracted bone marrow, a pint of it, to give to her brother. Amazingly strong lady. She actually competed in the 1994 Olympics. You can go back, Google this, find it. She was there, 1994 Olympics. She didn't win a medal. She was interviewed after that, and, and Kristen Talbot said this, the Olympics are important, but not as important as helping others. One sports headline about Kristen, the headline said this, no medal, but plenty of courage. Sometimes courage doesn't look spectacular. It looks like the lion who hung out with Dorothy before meeting the Wizard of Oz. Kind of chumpy and not real brave in his mind until the wizard says, you've had courage all along, my friend. Sometimes courage doesn't look like winning and like high fives and like touchdowns and, and goals, and soccer goals. It doesn't look like, it doesn't, it's not wanting to win. Sometimes courage is doing what it takes in order to win like 4 a.m. Olympic training when no one else is watching. Sometimes courage isn't making everyone happy and, and being popular and having 1K likes on your posts. But sometimes courage is just God putting you in the right place at the right time and in the privacy of your heart and your prayers you say God I know what you want me to do and I can't do it but you can and so God let's do this together so be ready to make a difference maybe right where you were hoping but maybe somewhere else that's what Kristen Talbot did. She made a difference for her brother. There's a name for that behavior. Um, the, the behavior I'm describing is, is um, focusing your energy and your attention, your expertise, your, your attitude, your abilities, your attention, your faith, right? Focusing that all just laser focused into one person. And that's, for Kristen, that was her brother. That's called serving an audience of one. Kristen did that, and her brother was her audience of one. He was her higher calling, higher than the Olympics, higher than medals, higher than fame, higher than uh, uh, an athletic sports career that she could take and make money. Higher than all that was her brother's audience of one. Who was Jesus' audience of one? His father. Focused, Father, glorify your name. Father, his conversation's right, I'm in it, Father. And because of that, because he put his father first, you, you ended up in that mix of being his audience of one because his father was first. And so who is your audience of one? Make a Jesus. Make a Jesus, and when you do, when your thoughts are clear and sober, and you think more highly of Jesus than anyone else, you will be better at serving others. So guys, when you love Jesus more than you love your wife, you are a better husband. And mamas, when you love Jesus more than you love your kids, you're a better mom. And when you love Jesus more than you love your career, you're better, you're, you're better able to handle criticism or job displacement or income changes. 
when you love, when Jesus is your audience of one and he's your higher calling and you love him more than getting an Amazon package delivered to your front door, <gasps> then you're going to be a more generous person. That's how it works with audience of ones and, and higher callings. Uh, the Bible puts it this way, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. So uh, Jesus has not only saved you from sin and death and the devil, he saved you for a purpose. Jesus has made you his masterpiece so you have abilities and you can, you can serve him and, and when you serve him, you're serving others. So what are some of your abilities? Uh, what are you good at? Here's my guidance for that, is to be aware of your abilities and also beware of your abilities. So what does it mean to be aware of your abilities? It means to, to know what you're good at, to know what your abilities are. And you can do that by taking an assessment. I have all kinds of assessments that I can give to you as resources. Uh, you can also ask people who know you, ask your family, ask your friends, ask your coworkers, and literally go up to them and ask them this question. Hey, what am I good at? They will be honored that you ask them, and, uh, and, and you should be ready to trust their input, and it probably will confirm what you already know as to what you're good at and what your strengths are. So be aware of your abilities, and then also beware of your abilities. And I say that for this reason. Oftentimes our gifts, our strengths are also our curses because we understand our strengths the way that we do, but other people don't understand them in that way because they're not strengthed, they're not given abilities in that way. So that's why I'm saying be aware, but also beware of your abilities. When you have an ability to do something well that most other people don't have, okay, you're going to be able to do that quickly and easily in ways that they can't. And so what does that mean? You have to beware that you don't go so quickly and, and do it so, so easily that, that others aren't following along. Let me give you an example. I have a friend who's a NASCAR race driver. So let's just say he, that he comes over to my house and we're hanging out for the weekend and he says, hey, uh, let's drive to uh, Walmart and pick up some Frisbees. Um, I'll drive and you follow me in your car, <laughs> right? And so how's that gonna work, right? If he's not, if he doesn't beware of his, his professional ability to drive an NASCAR, he's gonna leave me in the dust. So be aware of your abilities and then also beware of your abilities. So, okay, so now what are your abilities? Are you doing what God made you to do? Okay, what is, what is God's purpose for you? Those are great questions and I, I continually pursue the answers to those questions every day, every week, on my own. And then I also help others answer those questions because they're great questions, and Christians ask those questions. Like, what, what are my abilities, and, and why did God get me out of bed today? What's God's purpose for me? Okay, so we talked earlier about the, the front end of God's purpose for you is believing, and the ultimate end, the final end, is heaven. So this is the question for what's here. Hey, and let me tell you what my experience uh, and the scriptures teach me. And they teach me this, those questions, uh, what am I made for? Why did God design me? What's my purpose here? Typically, people are looking more for the what and not enough at the why in those questions. So the what would be like, what am I supposed to do for a job? Okay, what, what person am I supposed to marry if I'm supposed to get married at all? Um, what, what, what should be my uh, limit as far as how many hours I work a week? Right? All those what's, great question, but if you deal with the what's without the underlying why, it will be much greater of a struggle. So go to the why first. What's your why? Why are you even serving? Why, why are you even pursuing a purpose? And the why has everything to do with Jesus, with clear thinking, sober judgment, thinking more highly of Jesus. And so when it's all about Jesus, then the, the why, then, then your what is going to be even clearer. So sometimes your what won't be clear and you'll, you'll be good on the why 
And that's okay. Jesus will help figure that out. There's a verse that talks about that here in Colossians 3. It says this, whatever you do, okay, whatever. That means that the what maybe isn't clear. So whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord. That's the why. My heart, I'm working for the Lord as working for the Lord, not for human masters. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. That's a great verse for both the what and the why put together. All right, I'm going to finish with a story. Um, kind of a long story. Hang in there. You'll, you'll enjoy this. Uh, it's about a girl named Amber. And Amber is an eighth grader, and Amber is very talented. One of her abilities is playing the violin. And Amber and her fellow eighth grade students uh, have been practicing for a performance day. And that performance day is that Amber and the rest of the band members in eighth grade are all coming out to give a solo performance on stage. And so it's performance day, the stage is there, the curtains are shut, all the eighth graders are backstage, and Amber's back there with her peers, and one by one their names are called, and they come out and they give a trumpet solo or a piano solo, or for Amber it's going to be a violin solo. And uh, she's getting closer and closer to being the one who's called out on stage, and she's getting more nervous and more nervous and her palms are sweating more, and the butterflies in her stomach, and she's just, she's just dreading going out to play her violin because she knows she's going to make mistakes. She's made mistakes before. She's looking to, well, how can I have this perfect performance? And she's putting all this pressure on herself, and her name is called, and she's next in line, and she almost turns the other way and runs, but instead, she says, i, I got to do this. All my friends did it. I have to do it too. She, she comes out. She takes the stage. She's under the spotlights like it's the voice. And uh, she looks out, and there in the crowd, in the audience, all kinds of people. There's the judges who are going to give her her score. That makes her extra nervous. But in the middle of the crowd of the audience, she sees her mom. And her mom is just beaming with delight, the way that in mom pride, the way that moms do, right? Her mom has this big smile on her face. There's no judgment in her mom's face and how she's looking. There's no fear in her mom's face. The, her, her mom's eyes are, are hopeful and eager. Her smile is approving of Amber, and it's as if her mom is looking at her saying, this is going to be the best performance in the world. And it was. Amber's violin solo, <laughs> she rocked it. It was the best she'd ever done because her mom was her audience of one. So serve Jesus, your audience of one. There will be all kinds of critics out there. There will be all kinds of voices, all kinds of detractors, even your own conscience, even your own criticism of yourself is going to be very loud, and, it, and these are all lies. You will feel like you are being judged and scored until you look and you see Jesus. You have clear, sober judgment. You think of Jesus more highly, and when you do, he is looking at you with a smile that says, I'm not judging you because that's done. I died for your sins already. You're forgiven. I'm looking at you in mercy. I've given you these gifts, and Jesus is just more eager than ever for you to have the best performance in the world, and you do. You knock it out of the park when you serve Jesus, your audience of one. A few days later, Amber went back, was, was at school, and it was band practice day, and she got together with the rest of the members of the band. There were 72 eighth graders in all in this middle school band, like an orchestra. Now, were all 72 instruments the violin? No. How many violins were there in the, in the band? Not, not even 18. There were only four, four violins. Amber was one of them. However, there were 18 different instruments that were playing in this band. And then they had the, the director of the band, the band director, telling them when to start, when to stop, when to get louder, when to get soft, right? And he's directing, and, and for the band, he is really their audience of one. As the band is playing, especially if they're playing in a concert, their attention is really focused on their director, who, who has instructed each band member individually and given them lessons. 
and he knows them. He knows their strengths and weaknesses. He knows each section. He knows the French horn section. He knows the percussion section. He knows that Billy on the bass drum tends to play too loud and too fast. <laughs> he knows all of them, and, and he, he directs the entire band for the good of what? What's their why? Their why is beautiful music. So while he's directing the band, uh, Amber and her violins are playing, and, and next to them is the saxophone section, and when the saxophone section is out of tune, the violins don't stop playing, throw their violins in the air and say, that's it, we're done! But the, the, the band director has taught them to keep playing through it, and when they do, and he hears the saxophone section, he hears their, their, their out of tune, play through it, and when they do, they continue making beautiful music. When the trombones play a wrong note, right? The clarinets don't smash their clarinets on the floor and say, what are you doing? You're not, you're not as good as we are at the clarinet. No, they keep playing and they play through it. You see that? So as they focus on the band director, he's able to keep the band, all the individual members and sections working together as one, and they make beautiful music. Here's a Bible verse that talks just like that, that explains that beautifully. It says this, for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. So as we consider our gifts as a church, as a school, as we look at the grace of God active in our lives through Jesus, not just saving us from something, but for something. I, I tell you what, I'm looking right now, and I see a crowd of people, some of you short, some of you tall, some of you big, some of you small. Man, I think I see way too many old people <laughs> out there. I, I see young people too. I see all kinds of people. I see black people. I see white people. I see brown people. I see lo lots of different people with different gifts and different abilities, and yet I just see one church. One. So thank you. Thank you, because some of you are very talented at analyzing numbers, and some of you are very good at teaching kids. And a small number of you can do both at the same time, standing on one foot, spinning around while throwing a Frisbee. <laughs> and uh, you amaze me. But because you are able to do that and you do it well, which the majority of us cannot do well, our church is better at that, and we make beautiful music to Jesus. Some of you can build like most of the rest of us cannot. Some of you can lead like most of the rest of us cannot. Some of you can make, like literally, make music, like our worship team up here on, on Sundays, better than the rest of us. Thank you, because when you do, you're doing something that the rest of us can't do as well as you, and you're helping our church serve God and write, make beautiful music to Jesus. Some of you are so skilled at showing compassion and care. Some of you are just good at showing up. That's a gift, by the way. Like when, when uh, Sundays, like, like you're here. We do, you're not one of the people that we look at and go, wow, where, where have they been? You're, you're here. You make it work. And when you're here, you're present, and you greet guests, and you, and you welcome people in and, and, and your presence. Whether you know it or not, or try it or not, it just fills this place. And that's a special gift that not everybody has. We need you. And so when you use that gift that not everybody else is good at, you help us as a church be better at those things. So thank you. Thank you for serving your audience of one, because when you do, you help this audience, you help our church be one as well. And as we do that, Jesus is in the audience, and he's smiling like we are going to have the best performance in the world. And by his grace, we do. Amen.